Today, the Trump Justice Department refers the John Kerry criminal case to the Southern District of New York. Two tweets from the president and the John Kerry criminal case becomes a priority for the Justice Department. And what's more, the statute they wanted us to use was enacted in 1799 and had never been successfully prosecuted. Almost 220 years on the books, there was not a single conviction. And so we investigated Kerry, uh, determined that he was entirely innocent, but still the Justice Department pushed and pushed and pushed. And when I declined, Attorney General <coughs> Barr would not take no for an answer. He then transferred the case to another district, which fortunately didn't indict as well. But it's an outrageous story of interference with the independence and integrity of a U.S. Attorney's Office. In this case, it was the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. And uh, you did what government does well, which was delay. You delayed this uh, 11 months. You tried to put off the moment of reckoning uh, with the Attorney General as long as possible. Uh, but they were pushing for you to search John Kerry's yes. electronic communications. That was the step that you would not go to. Well, I'm not going to search somebody's electronic communication when ultimately, even if I find something, I'm not going to charge them under the statute that we're, you know, studying... Uh, and analyzing. So, no, I wouldn't take that step. And what happened is the, uh, the Justice Department contacted us on the same day of another uh, Trump tweet, where Trump tweeted possible violation of Logan Act and, you know, John Kerry, possible violation of Logan Act. We got contacted that same day where they pushed us. What's happening with that order to search his emails? Where is it? Why haven't you filed it? Let's name names because mm -hmm. you, you do in this book uh, very clearly. You're talking about these tweets uh, from Donald Trump about John Kerry. Uh, the tweet was in the morning that afternoon. Ferrara got a call from Maine Justice. He was told that David Burns, the principal deputy assistant attorney general for national security, wanted to know why we were delaying. We had not proceeded to the order to look into Kerry's electronic communication. So David Burns, who was doing exactly what should never be done by any Justice Department official, is now very happily employed in a very rewarding law firm, as he probably will be for the rest of his life. And these kinds of people, of which in your book I'm getting the sense there were perhaps a dozen or so uh, in Maine Justice, were doing these things seemingly every day. I mean, just in your district, in your one out of the 94 federal districts, they were doing it to you all the time. It was unrelenting. Who knows what they were doing in the other ones? Exactly. Uh, and, so, uh, and so the David Burns characters in here, he, get, he gets mentioned once on one page of the book. But that revelation about David Burns uh, is a revelation that everyone should remember about David Burns because he represents a whole army of people like that in the Trump well, administration. I think we're going to find out a lot more about what went on behind the scenes with the congressional investigation that Senator Durbin announced. What we have now is communications. What I know about is communications between Maine Justice and the Southern District of New York. And what I believe Congress is going to find out, internal uh, conversations among uh, the people of Maine Justice. I'm very interested in seeing those. You know, when I saw that, uh, the question becomes right away, uh, and this is a question to you, how stupid are they? <laughs> how much of this will the Senate Judiciary Committee find to be in writing, in emails or texts or other forms? Yeah, I, I, I you know, never underestimate <laughs> the stupidity of some people. So I expect to see a lot of it. Because what I notice uh, in William Barr's most incriminating communication with you, it's verbal. It's not, he's not writing you anything. He's, he's in the room with you. He's right. saying it just to you, one-on-one. Right. On one. He's making sure there's no witnesses. Right. Uh, and so, you know, how much are they going to find? Well, I, I think they're going to find a lot. I think they are. I think that uh, between emails and text messages, uh, it's going to be interesting. You write, and the striking thing about this passage is it comes on page 274 of the book. And by the time you get to two, page 274 of the book, um, this might as well be 
in italics just at the top of every page of the book because this is what the book is it says the department of justice is not supposed to operate according to the president's impulses personal relationships and business interests and by the time we read that the case has been closed on that's exactly how the bill Barr justice department is operating. exactly you know i'm sure that what john kerry did pissed off the president trump mm -hmm. but pissing off the president is not a federal crime well it wasn't until the trump administration perhaps but you know but that's not how the the department of justice operated under bill barr the um your method was and i've seen this in government people in difficult situations in different places your, your method strikes me as first of all just i would describe as survival uh stay in this job but not fear this is this is not the story of someone trying to stay in the job for the job's sake trying to stay in the job for the sake of the resume it's trying to stay in the job to protect this job from being held by someone else and, and we don't would... know who those people could be who they wanted in there instead of you but i wouldn't stay in the job if it meant undermining the integrity and, the, and independence of the southern district of new york that always came first and so at the end it was basically when I sent out that press release, I knew that was the end of me, but I also knew that in all likelihood, Audrey Strauss would take over as acting U.S. attorney and not the outsider that Bill Barr wanted. So the, the inside account that we now have that Rachel and I were worrying about, wondering about so eagerly uh, on that Monday after the weekend was that you had a Friday meeting uh, with Bill Barr and discussions with Bill Barr. He's trying to get you to quit and he's offering you, well, how about this? How about running the <laughs> Security Exchange <laughs> Commission? Like anything to get you to quit so they can get their guy in there. Right. And you know you don't want their guy in there. You don't want to quit. And, and so you don't quit. And Barr then knows you didn't quit and you're out for the evening with your wife you're on your way to see the kids and suddenly Barr issues a public statement saying you have stepped down jeffrey berman has stepped down mm -hmm. and uh, the president intends to replace him and then you put out your own press release saying i have not left this job i am still in this job and that was the one where we all just jumped back and said i, I said i have I haven't resigned and I have no intention of resigning. Yeah. And then I cited language from obstruction of justice statutes. And I said, the cases of our office are going to continue unimpeded. And, uh, you know, that was an extraordinary night. And so he, one of the things I love about this is the relentless unintended consequences of decisions made in government and politics. And there was a decision made early in your story at the intersection of government and politics, and it wasn't made by you. It was made by Senator Gillibrand of New York, who decided <laughs> she would not, she would oppose your nomination to be confirmed as the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York. And one of the courtesies of the Senate is, even from the other party, is that uh, if the, the, to be confirmed in that job, you have to have the support of the senators from that state. She wouldn't give her support. So, the Trump administration said, sorry, we can't get you confirmed, but if you still want the job, we can put you in there temporarily uh, as a temporary appointment. And then maybe the judges in the district, after four months, they have a right to appoint someone if they want to. They might appoint you, then you might have it. And then maybe, maybe we'll get you confirmed or not, but you'll right. still have the job. That's exactly That's right. how you get the job. So you get the job when you're serving and Bill Barr, the attorney general, wants to fire you. The trouble is, the judges appointed you. Exactly. And so you, your theory of the case was, you cannot fire me. The judges appointed me. Exactly. Uh, there was a court order that, that, you know, appointed me by the judges. And only the judges could get rid of me. Or if someone was nominated or confirmed, the statute provides, you know, uh, then, you know, then I leave and the confirmed person comes in. But Barr didn't have that. He wanted me out immediately. We're five months from the election. It had to be immediate. And it, was a, it ended up being a complete blunder. Right, and so that's what gave you the leverage to force Barr to say publicly, um, the, the person who will take over is the person who you wanted to take over. Exactly. I, I was prepared to litigate the issue. Yes. 
and I like my We discovered chances. in the book you had a secret team of lawyers ready to go to sue the Justice That's Department, right. sue Bill Barr, sue the president, whoever it takes, to fight this fire. That's right. I ended up not needing to do it because I think that Barr realized you know, he didn't want the president, didn't want a very open fight on this issue so close to the election. And so, uh, you know, they just surrendered. The, uh, the book is full of so much more than what we will be able to cover here tonight, including the definitive story of how Jeffrey Epstein was finally convicted mm -hmm. and sent to prison. Uh, you have the story of a rap star getting involved with a gang who then turns uh, and testifies against the gang and has to sleep in your conference room when he's a witness because yes. it's too dangerous for the first for time. Yeah, a this cooperating witness slept in our conference rooms so when he testified, he didn't have to go outside on the street. He could walk across the bridge into the courtroom. Uh, the, the lessons for anyone who wants to grow up into this field are in this book in a very accessible way with the brilliant editing of my friend Scott Moyers, who edited a book for me, uh, which makes it such a great read. You know, I, I wanted to do this the Washington way, which is go through it surgically and find all the stuff that matters, and I'm not going to bother with the wrapper. But it's so beautifully structured and perfectly written that I was drawn into the whole thing, how you became a Republican to revolt against your Democratic parents all the way through, <laughs> all the way through uh, every piece of it. Uh, what is the defining lesson you would like a reader to take from this book? The defining lesson, I think, is that professional and, and integrity and honesty in government is so important and how vulnerable our system of government can be. If you have a president who wants to use the Department of Justice as his own law firm to, to, to target his enemies and to benefit his friends. And he appoints individuals at the Department of Justice and other departments who will do his bidding. We're lost. To, to that fragility, a final quick question. Um, after you're on Nicole Wallace, uh, some people who had worked in the Justice Department themselves said, well, why didn't he bring this to the Office of Professional Responsibility. What about the internal mechanisms within the Justice Department to deal with the problems you were having? Do they work? So my problems were with Attorney General Barr. Mm -hmm. The idea that I would be um, referring a case to the Office of Professional Responsibility, complaining about Bill Barr, who is OPR's boss, it's naive to think that's going anywhere. It, it doesn't work, and that's why our system requires people of good faith who will abide by their oaths to keep the Department of Justice independent from politics. Jeffrey Berman, thank you very much uh, for delivering us the final story about this. Uh, going to be fascinating to see what the Senate Judiciary Committee asks of you and asks of others who you name in this book. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. We appreciate it. And coming up, White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain.